Bien. The people of coastal Peru no longer speak any indigenous languages, and most have been incorporated into the modern economy and way of life. But in the Andean highlands, there are eight million people speaking Quechua, the language of the Incas, and many still value traditional practices and beliefs. Highlanders are traditionally farmers and herders. However, in recent years, each generation sends more migrants to work in In 1996, archaeologist Max Ulla observed the importance of rivers on the coast of Peru. He noted, the present cultivated state of parts of the Peruvian coast is due to the labors of the ancient Indians. The coast consists chiefly of a desolate sandy desert, but in a few places where a stream breaks through the mountains, splendid oases will be found. At such places, for thousands of years, Man has conducted the life-giving waters of the rivers and has overcome the great obstacles of the ground in magnificent style. Altitude is as important as water in determining the suitability of land for growing crops and raising animals. The horizontal distance from the Pacific coast to the tropical forests is relatively short, but traveling up the 20,000 feet to the Andes snow-covered peaks and back down to the tropical lowlands in the east, a traveler passes through many environmental zones and observes many different ways of using the diverse resources. Pastoralists live in the highest mountain regions where llamas and alpacas thrive in the cool, dry climate. Thousands of years ago, the inhabitants domesticated llamas as beasts of burden, and they remain an important means of transportation. People of the highlands also made use of the long, fine, woolly coat of the alpaca for textile production. For a myth on Pariacaca, a snow-covered mountain, touch the feather icon. On the coast, in the time of Wagayo Carrincho, there were many beautiful colored macaws, red, yellow, and blue. But when Pariacaca, the snow-covered mountain, and the great Waka with his five brothers appeared, the macaws were expelled to the tropical forests with Walyayo Carwincho, rival of the five brothers. Fleeing from the wrath of the five brothers, Walyayo Carwincho transformed into a cliff, but Pariacaca blasted the cliff with lightning so violently that it almost demolished the rocky mountain. While Yayo fled and turned loose a two-headed snake called Amaru, thinking, this will bring misfortune on Pariacaca. But Pariacaca stabbed the snake in the middle of its back with his golden staff, and the snake froze stiff and turned into stone. While Yayo thought, from here I'll fence Pariacaca in so he can't pass through. He set against him a parrot called the Kaki and made it brandish its winged points. But Pariacaca effortlessly broke one of its wings, turned the bird to stone, and climbed right over it. Once Pariacaca stepped over it, while Yayo Carquincho had no power left, so he fled toward the Anti Lowlands, followed by the beautiful colored macaws. At altitudes above the mark where most temperate crops will grow, potatoes thrive. The potato was first domesticated in the Andean highlands thousands of years ago. Since then, they have become an important food crop all over the world. Highlanders invented a method of freeze drying that increased the storage life of potatoes. Freeze drying also made potatoes lightweight and easy to transport. Chuño, freeze dried potatoes, supported highland traders on their treks to the Peruvian coast and eastern lowlands. Chuño fed the Inca armies as they expanded the empire to centers like Pachacamac and many other coastal sites stretching as far north as Ecuador and to Argentina in the south.
On the steep slopes of the lower highlands, elaborate terrace platforms were constructed for the irrigation of corn. Corn, or maize, was the most important crop grown on the slopes and valleys of the highlands. Like chuño, dried corn could be easily stored and transported. It was probably first domesticated in Mesoamerica around 7,000 BC. It quickly spread into other areas and has been dated to 5,000 BC in Panama and Ecuador. Corn, and especially corn beer, was an important ceremonial food, and its growing season was closely linked to the ritual calendar of the Incas. For information on corn beer, touch the feather icon. A large part of the corn harvest was used to make chicha, a very nutritious, low-alcohol drink that was fermented for several days. It was served in a special cup called a quero. Making chicha was an important task of the akyas, the special women who served in the cult of the sun. Chicha beer was served at ceremonial feasts. It was used in ancestor worship and offered both to the sun and to mummies. Thousands of fragments of queros and other vessels related to chicha making have been found at archaeological sites throughout the Andes, indicating that corn beer was an important drink even long before the Incas. Down on the coast, the earliest peoples probably relied heavily on fish and other marine resources. The cultivation of the river valleys began around 2500 BC. As the late 19th century archaeologist Max Ule noted, it was the labors of the ancient inhabitants that made the coastal valleys productive. What Ule did not realize was that crops and agricultural techniques originally developed in the tropical forests and highlands were instrumental in supporting early coastal civilizations. Pachacama. When the Spanish arrived in Peru, Pachacamac was a famous ritual center, attracting pilgrims from all over the highlands, up and down the coast, and perhaps as far away as the tropical forest on the other side of the mountains. There were two great temples at Pachacamac, the imposing Temple of the Sun, built by the Incas, and an older, more modest temple, built for the cult of Pachacamac. Inside the temple, Pachacamac was represented by a carved wooden pole, covered with designs of birds, fish, plants, and animals. Miguel de Estete was one of the few Spaniards to actually see Pachacamac in the temple. For his description of Pachacamac, published in 1534, touch the feather icon. We went to the top of the shrine, which was enclosed by three or four walls coiled around like a snail shell. It seemed more like a fortress than a temple of the demon. In the highest part, there was a small patio beside the room or cave of the idol, with a ramada, a roofed building, with posts covered in leaves of gold and silver. A few weavings were hung to provide shade. Beyond the patio was a closed door with guards who did not dare open it. This door was covered with many things, corals, turquoise, crystals, and other things. Finally, the door was opened, and we saw what was inside. It was dark and didn't smell very good. We took a light in and entered a very small cavern, crude, without any fine finish. And in the middle was a beam stuck in the ground with the figure of a man carved at the top, crudely worked and badly formed. And at the foot and all around were many things of gold and silver offerings. Max Ule a German archaeologist working at the site of Pachacamac in the late 1800s suggested that what is today known as the painted building is actually the remains of the temple of Pachacamac. The dry sands of the coast helped preserve vivid color paintings that once covered the temple's walls and stairs. The sands also preserved thousands of mummy bundles, many from times well before the Incas. The mummies are wrapped in elaborate textiles and topped with false heads. For a 16th century description of burial practices, 
touch the feather icon. Waman Poma, the 16th century author of a chronicle about Peru, remarks that there are different burial practices in different parts of the Inca Empire. People of the north coast dressed their dead in elaborate feathers and gold and silver ornaments. Mummies were paraded in grand processions. On the anniversary of a death, a mummy was removed from its burial chamber dressed in fine clothes, carried in procession, and offered food and drink. People of the southern highlands never removed the dead from their chulpas, tall stone burial towers. But on the anniversary of a death, food and drink offerings were made. People in the eastern lowlands placed the bones of their dead in hollow tree trunks and never again tended to them. Ule's excavations of burials and artifacts made in the Highland Inca style confirmed that the biggest structure at the site of Pachacamac was an Inca sun temple. The Temple of the Sun was built much later than the Temple of Pachacamac. As the Inca Empire expanded from the highland capital of Cusco to the coast, the Incas built sun temples at the most important places in their empire. Coricancha, in the sacred city of Cusco, is the only sun temple larger than the one at Pachacamac. For information on Inca religion, touch the feather icon. The lineage of Inca rulers claimed the sun god was their ancestor, so they themselves became living god kings, and the mummies of dead Inca rulers were almost as sacred as the sun. Inca rituals were related to a complex calendar. Besides the movements of the sun, the calendar was based on phases of the moon and the rising and setting of some constellations. Celestial movements were calculated and recorded on a system of multicolored knotted cords called quipus. Each month of the year was associated with a special ritual, some celebrated in public and some privately. The rituals were also associated with sacred places in the landscape, some marked with temples and others just rocks or mountain peaks. Near the Temple of the Sun, Ule excavated an area he identified as the Mamaconas, named after the women who served the Inca sun deity. Since Ule's excavation, the site has partially been restored. The chosen women who lived near every temple of the sun were called mamacones, or aquias. These women lived apart from the rest of the population, and the Spaniards compared them to nuns living in a convent. The aquias were especially talented weavers, weaving the finest and most valuable cloth in the Inca Empire. The most precious cloths were feather cloths, Many small feathers were tied to a cord, then sewn to a plain cloth. The feather cloth was used for apparel and other decorative purposes. For information on Andean weaving, touch the feather icon. Textiles have always been an important part of Andean life. Even very early weavings show a degree of technical development that would be nearly impossible to duplicate today. Most of the textiles were made from cotton and alpaca yarn. An astonishing diversity of ancient textile techniques and decorative motifs have been preserved by the dry sands of the coastal desert. Highland weavers were probably equally skilled, but few of their textiles have been preserved. The technical excellence of many coastal claws suggests there were full-time specialist weavers. We know that this was the case during Inca times, when Akyas wove the fine cloths used by the Inca ruling family and also used as sacrifices or decorations in the Temple of the Sun. Trade, politics, and ritual reinforce each other, and it is clear that Pachacamac was an important center for all three. At Pachacamac, to honor their ancestor deity, the Sun, the Incas built a huge Sun Temple but they allowed the cult of Pachacamac to continue, and in this way, the Inca took advantage of Pachacamac's widespread fame. As Pachacamac grew as a ritual center, it became an important economic hub, a center where trade between different groups took place, and where alliances between groups could be formed and reformed.
Pilgrimage. Koyur Riti, Snow Star, Mountain God of the Incas, a sacred place known to some as Taitacha, the Mountain Christ. From hundreds of towns and villages, thousands of people from all over Peru traverse meadows, streams, and ice fields on their yearly pilgrimage to Koyuriti. Many people make the trip alone, but most come as part of a group representing their community. The religious journey brings blessing to the pilgrims and their families and honor to the communities that participate. Preparation is complex. It involves the entire village and begins months before the start of the actual journey. Preparation begins by choosing a sponsor who is put in charge of organizing the village's participation in the pilgrimage. The sponsor selects a team of dancers, hires musicians, and provides all the food that will be eaten during the festivities. To be chosen as a sponsor is a great honor and a great expense. To be a sponsor fulfills one's obligations to the village and to Taitacha. Each group making the pilgrimage takes its community's portable Catholic icon on the journey. Usually, the icon is a simple painting. Sometimes, it is an elaborate statuette or crucifix. At each of the shrines and chapels along the route, the religious object receives a blessing. Blessing the icon is very important, and some say the reason for making the pilgrimage. With each blessing, the icon becomes more sacred, and when it is returned to the community, it is more powerful than when it left. On the way to the sanctuary of Sinkara, there are special landmarks and resting places. One is called Pukyai Pampa, the play field. Here, people build small houses and corrals of stones. The miniatures represent prosperity, the gift pilgrims hope to receive in return for making the pilgrimage. At the sanctuary of Sinkara, dancers put on costumes and perform. Each costume and particular dance step is associated with specific music. In the Andes, there are many styles of dance and many types of dancers, but each dance group has at least one ukuku, the bear. The ukuku dancers act like clowns, taunting the audience and other dancers. Chuncho is the Quechua name for people who live in the tropical forest. Dancers wearing feathers of birds from the lowlands and carrying wooden staffs represent the mythical pre-Inca ancestors of the highlanders. The ancestors fled to the jungle when the first Inca brought the sun to the world. Associated with primordial times, the ancestors are considered more primitive and more powerful than the highlanders. For a myth on Pariacaca, a snow-covered mountain, touch the feather icon. From Sinkara, several mini pilgrimages are made to other shrines. One special trek is made by the Ukukus. Leaving before dawn, they begin their climb to the glacier crossing ice fields where condemned souls dwell. Only the uncivilized, inhuman Ukukus are powerful enough to resist the evil spirits. The snowy peak is both a mountain deity from Inca times and the site of a miraculous apparition of Christ Taitacha. The mountaintops have always been sacred. Now it is impossible to separate Catholicism from the sacred landscape. Reaching the glacier, the Yukukus break off chunks of the sacred glacial ice and carry the blocks down the mountain. The melted ice will be carried back to their villages with tales of the journey and plans for next year's pilgrimage. Peru contains three major environmental zones, coast, highlands, and tropical forest. 
Each zone has very different resources for producing handicraft and food. Textiles, which combine alpaca and cotton, are evidence of early trade between highlands and lowlands. Traditionally, alpaca, yama, and vicuña wool was used to produce textiles in the highlands, while on the coast, cotton was used. Even within the highlands, there is a diversity of environments and products. Corn is grown in the lower, more temperate altitudes, while potatoes, other native tubers, and a few native grains are the only cultivated crops that can be grown in the higher, colder altitudes. Although the three zones varied greatly, Peruvian communities were never really isolated. Even in pre-Columbian times, there was a flow of products from one region to another as people in different environmental zones engaged in trade. The Incas increased the efficiency of travel by incorporating traditional trade routes into an elaborate road network throughout their empire. The system extended more than 14,000 miles. Often, these roads were constructed as straight lines and paved with stones. Rope and stone bridges spanned the many and treacherous mountain streams. Large Inca administrative sites located along the eastern flanks of the Andes, on the frontier with the tropical lowlands, may have been used as fortifications and military garrisons against hostile lowland peoples. Many of the sites also served as storage facilities of huge capacity and may have been state centers of exchange and ports of trade. For information on Inca accounting, touch the feather icon. The Inca did not have a written language. State administrative records were kept on knotted strings called quipus. Knots at intervals along variously colored strings were used as notational devices for accounts of population, domestic animals, labor tribute, agricultural products, and calendrical events. Traditionally, non-local produce and goods were transported long distances between market centers by caravans of llamas. Several hundred llamas bearing packs of burden amounting to tons of goods and produce could be managed by a few drovers. Rare and exotic items such as feathers, coca leaves, tobacco, turtle egg oil, gold, silver, medicinal herbs, textiles, dyes, gums, and foodstuffs, to name a few, were imported from the Montaña zone and the tropical forests to the east of the highlands. Highland people, in turn, probably exchanged stone axes, salt, highland crafts, and crops with tropical people. Tropical lowland feathers were an important item in the pre-Columbian trade system. They were important for ceremonial use and were worn by the elite on clothing and headdresses. They provided a very visible marker indicating high rank and status. Part of the reason feathers were valuable to the Andean highlanders and coastal people was probably because they came from far away. They could be obtained only from the tropical lowlands. For information on headdresses, touch the feather icon. Pre-Columbian people wore a great variety of headdresses. Most were made from a combination of several different parts, woven basketry, textile turbans, braided slings, and feather plume ornaments. Many included bird effigies. Style varied from area to area and according to status and social role. During Inca times, dress was strictly regulated, and Bernabe Cobo, a Spanish priest living in Peru in the 1500s, wrote that men and women of each nation and province had their own insignias and emblems that could not be exchanged for insignias from another nation. Any attempt to do so would be severely punished. Over the ages, some of the products have changed, but interregional trade is still an important part of life in Peru. Large towns have daily markets, but most villages have markets only once a week. Religious festivals often become large marketplaces. Pilgrims attending these events come from far and wide, bringing an assortment of goods and creating excellent opportunities for trade. In fact, many people come to the festivals only to sell or trade in the market. People from towns specializing in craft production 
exchange with those bringing products and crafts from other environmental zones. Similar exchanges probably occurred throughout the ages at ceremonial centers such as Pachacamac on the coast of Peru.